Very good. Welcome and good evening. We are glad you have tuned in this evening to join us for our Wednesday midweek meeting, our prayer meeting time this evening as we study chapter 24 of the book Prophets and Kings, Destroyed for Lack of Knowledge is the title. Uh, in this chapter, we'll conclude the first part dealing with uh, the northern tribes. Then we're, we're going to get into some other subjects here in the Bible as we move on through time, move through this period of the Old Testament, uh, get into some other things connected with uh, Isaiah and the other prophets, and um, that, that'll be really nice. Looking forward to that. But uh, this chapter this evening is uh, pretty intense, dealing with uh, the fall of the northern tribes. And so um, if you're joining us for the first time, you can go to our website and you will find the study outline as well as a PDF version of the book that you can download and then you can have that uh, to follow along. That's what I'll be using in the uh, study outlines. Paging is connected to uh, that book that's the PDF online. You can also go to Ellen White's Estates website and there they have the majority of her books available for download, uh, so you can get all your collection. I like to do that on my iPad, have the books there, download it, so whenever I need them, they're right here. That's what's really nice about uh, some of the modern technology. Instead of having to carry a big stack of books, now you can put them all right on there, and they're available. also want to remind you, uh, say it again at the end, to pray for uh, Doug Batchelor's Amazing Facts Revelation program is going on. Uh, for us here on the East Coast, it's at 10 o'clock, but you can catch the replay the next day at a better time, or you can just see the rewind, uh, the, the replay uh, whenever you're able to. And so uh, really good presentations, and you want to join that and be a part of that. You can catch it on Facebook. You can go to our website also, and you'll see a link there for that information. And so uh, keep, uh, keep Doug in prayer as he's doing the online outreach uh, for the, the, the folks to be able to see things about Revelation and Daniel and Revelation. So, but we are ready to uh, have a prayer and get started with chapter 24 here tonight. So let's, let's bow our heads and we'll say a prayer together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to get together this evening. Uh, some of us here locally as well as our, our church family online, thank you for the promise of your Holy Spirit to be poured out as we study and we pray for your Holy Spirit tonight as we uh, open this chapter and go through it. It's a very, uh, it's a, a, a chapter on instruction and guidance for us, a warning for us. And so I just pray that you will please guide us and help us as we go through that. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. So uh, the title this evening on chapter 24 is Destroyed for Lack of Knowledge. Destroyed for Lack of Knowledge. And um, it's interesting, the idea here is, is lack of knowledge, and, and what you know, comes to my mind is that the title destroyed for lack of knowledge, even though the knowledge is there. You know, and I think of that today, you know, people are so ignorant of the Bible, but yet Bibles are everywhere, especially in America, especially here in North America. Uh, you, you can have, what, 50 apps, there's 50 different Bible apps that you can have, Bibles are everywhere. We have Bibles in our pew. If you need a Bible, kind of, if you need a Bible, send me a Facebook post or send us an email and we will send you a Bible. Bibles are available. You have the Bible Society that you can go to and they'll send you Bibles. Bibles are everywhere, but yet we are here with Bibles everywhere, the law of God everywhere, and yet we have this lack of knowledge. We have this, as it were, this ignorance, a uh, spiritual ignorance of God's word. And, you know, that's what we're going to see here in this chapter tonight. That the, the children of, of God here, the northern tribes, it wasn't that they didn't have the scrolls. It wasn't that the law wasn't available. But we're going to see how God, uh, um, say, I'm sorry, see how Satan worked it to a place where they got to where they had forsaken the Lord. And once you do that, God is now limited at what he can do. And as we looked at last week, Assyrians came in and, and they worked with uh, the taking and, and destroying the 12, I mean, the northern tribes. Question number one starts right off here on the first couple of uh, sentences of the book. If you have the book, we're looking here on chapter 24. God's favor toward Israel had always been conditional on their obedience. Now, why is that? Why is it that God's it says here, God's favor toward Israel has always been conditional on obedience. What does obedience have to do with God being able to take care of us? 
What does it have to do? Well, you see, God is limited. If, if God says this is what's best for you and you choose not to listen to that, you choose not to obey, then you limit how God is able to take care of you. And, and, it, and our, our government can take care of us if we follow the laws. Whatever it is, obedience in, is always connected to safety. You can look at it in that way. It's connected to being protected. And here God is saying, look, if you worship me, follow me, and do what I'm asking you, I can protect you. And so his, it says here, his, his, God's favor is always good. So, so the thing is, the opposite of be, so can God bless you in disobedience? Because that would be the opposite. Can God show favor? Do you reward children for disobeying? Oh boy, what home would that be? I, I can tell you my home wasn't like that. <laughs> there was no reward for disobeying mother and father. There's just, it doesn't happen that way. If you're speeding and the police pulls you over, they don't come and like, good job, well done. We've had some speeders today, but you, boy, you went 25 miles over the speed. Well done, well done, good job. Here's a certificate. No, it doesn't work like that. And here it's the same. God's favor toward Israel has always been conditional upon their obedience. The next sentence is the answer to question number one. How did Israel first enter into covenant relationship with God? At the foot of Sinai, they had entered into covenant relationship with him as his peculiar treasure above all people. Suddenly, they had promised to follow Solemnly, I'm sorry, I got that, uh, my line to there. Solemnly, they had promised to follow in the path of obedience. And now those, those famous words, if you, you're familiar with Exodus, that those famous words, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. All it is, it's like a commitment. It's a, a marriage valve. I do, I do, I do. Yes, and here it is with God's people. They're entering into a covenant with him, a relationship with him, so that God can bless them and take care of them. So question number one says, how did Israel first enter into the covenant relationship with them? Ultimately, they're saying, we will do what you're asking us. All that you said, we will do. And that was the agreement. So God is saying, look, here's my Ten Commandments. Here's my blessing. Here's what I'll do for you. If you listen and follow, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is, is you're going to be rewarded. You're going to have prosperity in your crops. You're going to have prosperity in your home. You have prosperity with your children. Your nation will flourish. You know, we begin the, the book looking at the idea of, of Solomon. And when Solomon was obeying and God's people were obeying and they were listening and everything, man, Israel was flourishing and doing well. Okay? God's favor is important, but it's connected to obedience. Now, going on here to question number two, it's, let's see, do we have a, a volunteer that can read for us question number two? We have a volunteer? Yes, Paul, go ahead. What did God promise the Israelites if they obeyed his commandments? Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. So it, it says there yeah. in that paragraph, the Israelites had been specially charged not to lose sight of the commandment of God. And don't, don't miss that phrase there, lose sight of the commandments of God. In obedience to which they would find strength and blessing. So that's what it is. What did God promise the Israelites? That he would be their God, he would take care of them, they would have strength and blessing. They would have prosperity. They would have what they needed for, for the, their, their crops. You know, again, we're looking at it in the context of Moses and his people in the promised land. Their crops would be taken care of. Their flocks would be taken care of. Their, their people would be taken care of. The disease, which was big then. God said, if you listen to me and follow me, you won't have disease. These, these nations that are around him that were disobedient to God, these pagan nations were around, they would go and uh, kill and destroy the village. God said, saying all of that will be put in check. How does that apply to us today? How does that apply to us today? Because we don't, we don't grow crops. We don't have foreign invaders coming in to destroy our cities and break up our homes. How, what, is, what is it here? What is the strength and blessing 
that God gives to us. And again, we're looking at it in the context of, of North America. Each, each country, each continent will have it a little bit different because there are cultures where they're still very reliant upon agriculture, very reliant upon having enough animals to help feed. But for us in our setting here this evening, what is it that we need today that is the strength and blessing? What would be examples of this? Yes. Make sure the button is... It's. Okay. But we also have to depend on the crops. I mean, if the farmers and the land is not blessed, we won't eat. Okay, but... So we also need to depend on that. Okay. But, but I don't grow the crops. Someone else is growing the crops. So, so then, so the people that are growing the crops, most of them are not necessarily Christians and following the Lord. You see what I'm saying? So putting it in our context, because for the people then, they had to have their sheep, they had to have their own crops growing, the grapes, all of those things. So that stuff was how they lived. Now we are on a, a different society as far as, yes, we have crops in the Midwest, we have orchards in the South, we have apple orchards here, and you know a lot of those things are, are uh, definitely conditional to the Lord taking care of us. But for us individually today, we don't grow those things to be able to go. The, the way that we have to go to the grocery store is different now. So, yes, so we had a couple of mics up. Okay, so Olga, Mangela, and then Paul. Let's make sure the uh, button is pushed and so the light is green. Yes. It's okay, on. there we go, there we go. I would think it would be more like the blessings for us with our health. Okay. With our jobs. Right. With our children being healthy. Even right. Even though we don't have the crops and we don't do that, but as, as also to bless us in a way that we don't go astray and that our children don't go in this worldly place. Right, God. right. Bless us that way. You're right. And, and those are big things. Our home is yeah. taken care of, our jobs, our cars. Yeah. You know, you're right. Our children, the schools. You're right. Yes. yes. Uh, Mangela. What? Yes. No matter what we go through in this life, mm -hmm. he has blessed us in, in the way that we don't lose faith in him. He mm. gives us the joy, no matter what trials come our way. We will have trials, you know. Not everyone who is a believer will have a job continuously, uh, you know. N not that they will have the strength and health mm. continuously. When we fail, when we, when we don't have that good health, when we don't have that job, still he blesses us in the sense that he gives us that inner peace and comfort saying to us that I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Right. And that blessing is a blessing. Not everyone has that blessing. The people fall apart. When right. things don't go right, people fall apart. But God's children will not fall apart because he's there to, he gives us that assurance. I'm there to take care of you right. no matter what you're going through. Yeah, like David said, I, I've, I've been young and I've been old and I've never seen God's people suffer. So God does take care of us. Yes, Paul. Uh, a good marriage, happy relationship with your family. Yeah. That's uh, if you obey, because if you don't, uh, there's all, all kinds of room for trouble. Right, you know. right. Relationships break down, you're right. That's right. it. So strength and blessing is what God's offering. Yes, Carmen. Oh, blue mic. Because we had the promise of the Bible in our mind. Mm -hmm. Whenever we are... We are like uh, lifting the people that is sad mm -hmm. or is um, uh, behavior, by behavior or whatever. So we are like a kind of optimistic, like a kind of patient, right. like a kind of being more balanced. That right. We don't lose our tempers. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. That's right. The strength and blessing, it says, Take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, had been the word of the Lord to them through Moses. Least thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen. You notice it says there again, unless you forget, unless you forget. And it said that earlier, it was charged to not lose sight. And, and that's the problem when we live in a place where things go well, 
we begin to lose sight of God and the fact that he's blessing us and taking care of us. And then we begin thinking we can do it on our own. And then we go a whole day on our own. Then we can do a whole week on our own. Then a whole month on our own. And next thing you know, you have people that, that go out and, and, boy, I have food, I have a job, I don't need God. And that's a dangerous place to be in because the, the reality is, is that just because everything is going well, like you said, Mangela, doesn't mean that it's God's, uh, that you don't need God. You need God. And, and you always have to be careful when, and, and I've always been cautious about uh, the idea that, that everything's okay without God. I, I've yet to see interviews with people, whether they're wealthy, movie stars, or singers, or whoever it is, for them to really be honest with their life, there is no peace, saith the Lord, for the wicked. So don't confuse and think because a few people in a few interviews or a couple articles say, oh, my life's perfect. Everything's great. I have no problems. There's a lot of denial because the reality is, is look at the statistic that there's more depression in America than in any other country in the world. How could that be if you have everything here? We don't have God. Whether you have a job or you don't have a job, if you don't have God in your life, you're going to have a hard life. Having a job doesn't mean everything's going to go well. So, so, but God wants us to have jobs. God wants us to have strength. God wants us to have peace to be able to go from day to day. That's God's plan for us, okay? So, but not to lose sight. There's the idea there. Number three. Somebody want to read for us uh, number three. Question number three. Do we have a volunteer? Want to read for us? Okay. What did Moses prophesy would happen to the Israelites if they disobeyed God? They mm. will introduce corrupt forms of worship and, and bow down to graven images. God will anger and they will perish. Yeah, boy, that whole paragraph there, you really have to write that whole paragraph. Good job, Olga. You have to write that whole paragraph. Moses traced the evils that would result from departing from the statues of Jehovah. And then it lists things in here, that you had the anger of the Lord upon him. And it says, you shall soon utterly perish off the land, whereunto you go from Jordan. He warned him, you shall not prolong your days upon it, utterly be destroyed, Scatter you among the nations and be left few in numbers uh, when you, and you shall serve God's, uh, the work of men's hand, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. In other words, you're not having God's protection and problems are going to come without God with you. And, and I think really we see that in a large extent to, to our nation, to America. You see that, that we're a nation that does not follow God, and we have problem after problem after problem after problem. Would it be different? I would like to believe it is. I think, biblically speaking, any nation that follows God and puts His law first and listen to Him and obey Him is going to be a nation that's per. And, and you think about this country of ours when it first started, you know, it really did. It came over here. It had separation of church and state. It had freedom of religion. We worship God, all of these things. And God blessed this country. It wasn't without fault. There were a lot of problems, the issues that needed to be corrected and should have been corrected. But yet here God is telling us, look, for his people, his people at this time, if you stayed with him, blessing would come. Stay with him, blessing would come. And there's an interesting thing here. It says here, and the Lord shall scatter you among the nations. Well, we looked at last week, what did, the, uh, what did the Assyrians do to the northern tribes? They came in, attacked them, and what did they do? <laughs> scattered them. Scattered them. Took them all over the place. This was God withdrawing. And I shouldn't really say withdrawing. It was just simply that he couldn't take care of them anymore. When you're not listening to God, like we said at the beginning, his favor is connected to his obedience and to obedience unto him. So, so how, did this, how did the devil work? So here in these first couple of pages, it was a, a review of what God said in Deuteronomy through Moses of what he wanted to do for his people, how he wanted to bless his people. He said, I'm giving you my Ten Commandments, I'm giving you my statutes, I'm giving you my laws, I'm giving you all these things. If you will listen and follow and obey me with the covenant you made, I will 
favor you. I will bless you. I'll give you strength, all of these things. But if not, you're going to have problems. So all of this is connected to listening to God. What did Satan do, which is what he's doing today? What did Satan do? Question number four. Let's see if we have a a volunteer to give us uh, an answer to question number four. said, how did Satan help to gradually develop the apostasy of Israel? What what did he do? Yes, yes, Mangela. Generation, Satan had made repeated attempts to cause the chosen nation to forget the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments that they had promised to keep forever. Yeah. He knew that if he could only lead Israel to forget God and to walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, they would surely perish. Yes, yes. He knew that if he could lead them step by step by step away, that would be taking them and putting them in a position where God is not able to take care of them, destroyed for lack of knowledge, to the place where they had gotten to where they were worshiping idols, they weren't listening to God, they weren't following Him, they weren't following His commands. And, you know, really, that's, uh, I think that's where we're at today. You know, we, 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 we are not, you know, we, we're supposed to be a Christian nation, the United States. We're supposed to be a godly nation, and, and, and we're not. With the laws that, that are, are being voted, the things that are being done, we're, I don't know if we could say we're a godless nation. I mean, we, we praise the Lord, we have the freedom to come to church, we have Bibles available, but the devil has done his job well, just like here's the chosen people, God's people, they entered into a covenant with him. They were supposed to remember their deliverance from Egypt. They were supposed to remember the time that they were coming from Mount Sinai. They were to remember all these things. And the devil just said, little by little, we're just going to push God out. And we have that same thing happening to us. Generation after generation, step by step, we're to the place now where some of the things that are being done, wow. You think about what's happened in the past 10 years compared to what we know 50 years ago. Even when I was a kid growing up, stuff that's going on, from whether it's on television to, to the uh, same gender allowance of marriages and, 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 and the legalization, uh, you know, in many states of marijuana, I grew up, I never thought you would ever hear. You know, some folks can remember back when they legalized alcohol. You know, what? How is that? So, so these things that we have going on. So we have to ask ourselves, has the devil done the same to us that he did to them in the time of the northern kingdoms that we have we allowed? And you know, we have to be careful from one generation to the next, even in our own families. How are we allowing ourselves to, you know, I, I, like I, I've shared several times, I think this article was correct in saying we cannot talk bad about millennials because millennials simply are doing what the parents allowed them to do. You know? So a lot of these behaviors that they say the millennials have, or now the Gen Z, that they do, it's because that uh, we are allowing them to do that. You know? But it's allowing step by step, little by little. I remember, uh, some of you may remember this uh, Pastor Joe Cruz uh, from Amazing Facts. He was the one who really got the Amazing Facts going. He had a book called Creeping Compromise. Creeping Compromise. In other words, little by little, one step at a time. It was like the, the, the dresses didn't go from your ankle to way up high, <laughs> did they? You know, the dresses didn't go like that, did they? And television, television didn't start out with the way it is now. Man, even when I was a kid, I remember some of the black and white pictures. There was very little kissing. There was little of this. You never had cursing. Oh, no, that was... Now, today, it just... How does that happen? Little by little, generation after generation. Yes, Tanya. I have two comments online. One from Ella. It says, despite the efforts of Satan to dwarf God's purpose for for Israel... Nevertheless, even in some of the darkest hours of the history, when it seemed as it, if the forces of evil were about to gain victory. And then Anthony put in here, the loss of God marks the coming return of Jesus. Yes. 
It's a, it, it, you know, the parallel is there. When, when, when the nation rejected God, God was not able to work with them. Destruction came. It happened with the 12 tribes. It happened with uh, the Jewish nation with Christ. And it's ha- it will happen again for us at the end of time. By rejecting God, the time will come when God is not going to be able to work with us. Yes, Carmen, did you, do you have a question? St- a question, yeah. I always confuse. Is Ephraim, I say correct, Israel? Ephraim. Also, it's not a person. Well, yes, Ephraim was one of the uh, children of, of Jacob, yes. It was one oh. of the sons. And it was one of the sons of the handmaid, right? Was it Beulah or Zilpha? I don't remember which one. Because Ephraim, because you, you had um, the two sisters. Mm-hmm. and uh, um, But Ephraim was not with, uh, what was the, now I'm forgetting, Rebecca and what was this? Uh, what was the? Huh? Leah. Leah, yes. Ephraim wasn't from Leah. It was, uh, you have to fact check me on that, but Ephraim was a person, yes. He was one of the sons of Jacob. And I don't remember, I think it was with Beulah or Zilp, Zilpa, Zilpha, the, the two handmaids. Because uh, remember when uh, Leah and, and Rachel left, they took their handmaids with them. And then they had children from those. So I think Ephraim was one of those. But uh, I think Priscilla's Googling that there for us. Let's see. But, so Ephraim was a person, yes. Yes, he was. But he, it was the name of the tribe, one of the tribes of the northern Israel, of the ten tribes of Israel. Because just like you have Benjamin, Judah, Manasseh, you know, you had the different children, had the tribes, Ephraim was in the north. He was one. It was, a, it was really a big tribe, but it was one that God worked with a lot. And that's why in Amos and Hosea, you see here talking about, uh, I think it's, um, is it in Amos where it says, uh, leave Ephraim alone. He's attached to his idols. I'm done with him. You know, so it finally got to the place where God tried and tried and tried and he didn't, he wouldn't respond. Yes, yes. So, so Ephraim was the name of the tribe that was one of the children of Jacob. Yes. Yes. Did you find it? Nope. Oh, I thought you were Googling that. Who, who was Ephraim's mother? There we go. Okay, so let's, let's move on here. Number five. Somebody read for us question number five. Yes, Mo? N- no, we haven't done five. We, we alluded to it, but we didn't read it. Yes, go ahead, Mo. Number five for us. Blue mic. How God showed compassion for his church? The nature of God is to be merciful mm. and gracious, long suffering. Uh, <coughs> abundant in goodness mm-hmm. and true. Yes. Forgiving and equity, transgression and sin. Yes, yes. God is compassionate. You know, and, and that's why uh, Psalm says, you know, the sun rises on the just and the unjust. You know, that's, that's where people get confused. They think because I have food and the sun comes up, then I don't need God. Not understanding that God in his mercy is supplying us with these things to try to win us and to try to work with uh, drawing us to him. Yes, because God is all of those things. That's uh, Exodus 34 when Moses was on the mount. And this is when God passed by Moses. He said, this is who I am. You know, this is who I am. Uh, Abundant in goodness and truth. Keeping mercy. It goes on here. It says, nevertheless, even in some of the darkest hours of their history, talking about Israel, when it seemed as if forces of evil were about to gain the victory, the Lord graciously revealed himself. Time and time again, you had Israel when they were in desperate, they had sin, they were worshiping idols, but they would cry out to the Lord, Lord, please have mercy on us, and God would have compassion. God would have compassion. But one thing that we don't like to talk about is that there is a limit to God's compassion and mercy. There's a limit. It goes so far, and then that's it. You know, and, and God does judge. God does have judgment. And I know a lot of people, uh, you know, we don't want to judge one another, but that's not biblical. Now, what the Bible says is we're not to judge their eternal salvation. 
So I can't say you're lost, you're saved, you're lost, you're saved, you're lost, you're saved. Yeah, we can't do that. But by their fruit shall you know them. So you're to judge fruits to know how to associate, how to work with. How, it's like when you have someone in a job. Should you go to a bank and say, um, well, what is your background history? Well, don't judge me. Well, a bank is going to say, oh, yes, we will judge you. So you have a history of theft and you want to work in the bank with the money. And then say, oh, don't judge me. That doesn't work like that. And then we come into Christianity and we're like, oh, don't judge me. Well, we're not judging your eternal salvation, but how do we know to help you unless we judge you? Based on your behavior and your actions, your words and things. And so God is saying, look, there is judgment and there are boundaries to his mercy and his grace. It's long-suffering. It goes for a long time, but it's not endless. It does have boundaries. Yes. Going back to Ephraim, Ella found that it's Ephraim and Manasseh are Joseph's sons, not Jacob's. Oh, yes, it's okay. It's the sons of Asenath, jo Joseph's Yes, wife. yes, Joseph, that's right, Ephraim and Manasseh, grand, yes. those. Yes, those two, uh, uh, af actually those two children took, that's why there's not a tribe of Joseph. Joseph did not uh, get a, a place, his two sons did. Uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. That's right. Boy, thank you. I forgot about that. So Ephraim is uh, Joseph's son, which he had in Egypt with Asenath, the high priest's daughter that he was given to and wife. All right? And um, actually, if you read in Revelation, you'll see in the 12 tribes, the tribe of Dan had been taken out, and uh, Manasseh and Ephraim replaced them. Yes. Uh, yellow Mike? Um, I wonder if why Joseph was not given a tribe. Is it because he got married to an Egyptian woman? You know, that's a good question. I, I really don't have the answer to that. I just know that, that uh, Ephraim and Manasseh uh, came in and took the place of, of two tribes that didn't get... Really, it was because uh, Levi was the priesthood, so they didn't get a, a, a piece of land. And so, yeah... Yeah, good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. Why, why Joseph, and maybe someone online could look that up, why Joseph uh, was replaced with his two sons. Um, I know their names were uh, causing to forget in another one. So there was, you know, when, um, when Jacob blessed those two, he put his blessing upon them. And, um, um, you know, I have to check on that because I don't remember the answer to that. But I do know that Ephraim and Manasseh did take the place of uh, tribes. Yes, brother. Yes. Yes, Athenus. Yes. She is the uh, daughter of the high priest in Egypt. And she was an Egyptian woman. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, that was when Joseph was named uh, Zaphonath Panea and became governor of Egypt. He was put in place uh, where Pharaoh sat only on the throne. So, and then he uh, was given that, that, that lady to be his wife. And so, um, yeah, I don't know because, you know, in the lineage. There are, uh, there are people who have uh, places, um, not the, the sons, uh, but, you know, the other ones you have, like Ruth, who was a Moabite. Uh, you have, um, um, uh, who, who was it in Jericho, the lady that uh, let the two spies in? Um, Rahab, no, uh, Rahab, is it Rahab the harlot, you know, she's in the lineage. She married one of the spies and was in the tribes there, and so... So I don't know if it was because that she was Egyptian. I'll have to check that out. It's an interesting thought. I don't remember the answer to that. But, uh, but God tenderly calls. Tenderly is call, trying, but there comes a point when that's it. There's no more. And here, notice question number six. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. What is this knowledge God is referring to? What is the knowledge that God is saying you're destroyed because you don't have? What is it that people don't have today? You know, we talked about it in our series. Is that it's the law of God. You, you see in the last days, in Revelation, the worship of God is connected with his law. Um, and and I, I have trouble where people separate. They say, well, we just need Jesus. We don't need his law. Well, Jesus is the law. God is the law. You can't separate the two. Now, people try to, and they try to, to make the law uh, uh, by self-helps and self-works, you can only keep the law with Jesus. 
You only keep the law of Jesus. And, and following the law is simply following who Jesus is. The law is simply a transcript of God's character. Those two go together. So when you say, well, you separate the law, really what you're doing is you're separating yourself from God. Because remember, when the, uh, when the question was posed to Jesus, what is the greatest, what is the greatest, to, you know, what is the greatest two laws? And, the, and, and Jesus said, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and thy neighbor as thyself. Well, the, that first part represents the first four commandments. Loving thy neighbor as thyself represents the second two upon those principles of loving God and your neighbor is where, and all of that's connected into who God is. That's who God is. And he's saying, look here, when we're destroyed for lack of knowledge, it's because we are destroyed for the lack of knowledge of his law. And it all has to be put together. You can't pick half and half. You can't pick one. You can't, as a matter of fact, the Bible says, if you offend in one, you're guilty of all. And you know, if you stop and think about it, here's an interesting challenge. Study out how each one of the laws, the Ten Commandments, are interconnected. If you start with the first one, when you, when you have another God before God, then you will take the Lord's name in vain, and then you will have idols, and then you won't keep the commandment, then you won't follow mother and father, then you won't follow your brothers and sisters, your covenant. They're all intertwined. When you break one, you ultimately, when, when you break the fifth commandment about honoring your mother and father, well, you're breaking the first four, the first four. Because when you choose your way over a godly parent's way, you're choosing your way over God's way. And one by one, they're all interconnected. And as you break one, they all start falling apart. They all start falling apart. And here God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's what's happened. The devil had gotten them to push the law out, and the northern tribes were living without God's law. And that had problems. Question number seven brings us to that. Somebody read for us question number seven. We have a volunteer to read question. Okay, yes, Paul, thank you. Question number seven. What were the consequences for transgressing transgressing? God's law in the days of Noah and in the days of Abraham. Mm. Well, in the days of Noah, they had the flood. Okay. And in the days of Abraham, they had Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, yes. And, and what happened when they made void the law? They were destroyed. They were destroyed. See, now understand this. Uh, you see, God, God is, is here to protect you. His law is around you. You have the devil outside who his... He, you know, Jesus said Jesus is a liar and a murderer. So Satan wants to murder us. He wants to destroy us. He doesn't care for us. He has enmity. He has anger against us. He does not want you to flourish and do well. And if you're flourishing and doing well outside of God, he only uses that to try to entice Christians to leave God so they can be like that. Don't think that Satan flourishes people because he wants them to be happy and do well. Because some people who are flourishing and doing well with the worldly things inside are dying. So the devil does these things. So he's out here to bring destruction. And God is, has his law around us. He's protecting us. And when you step outside of that, you're on your own dealing with the devil. Well, how well do you think you're going to stand up against the devil? You're not. What's he going to do? He's going to destroy you. He's going to break you down. Because the devil wants you to die immediately. Because if you die without having salvation through Jesus Christ... Bigger picture here, you carry your sins, and he doesn't have to carry your sins. See, at the last days, when the judgment comes, you remember how in the Old Testament they had the scapegoat, and all the sins of the people were put upon that lamb? So the people went free for the punishment, but the punishment was on the lamb, and the lamb took it off. Well, the scapegoat represents Satan. Know this, Satan understands that in the last days, if I take, let's say, like, like my phone is the sin. Here, this is sin. If I can get you to take yours, I don't have to carry it. But everybody else who I am not able to lead into destruction, who receives salvation, I will suffer for their sins. Satan doesn't want to suffer. He wants you to suffer for your own sins. And that's why if he could destroy you now, outside of salvation, he will because then your fate is sealed. 
Probation closes when you die. You understand that, right? There's no second chance once you die. And that's why Satan is trying constantly to kill people. Kill them all. And die in your sins, then you carry the sin. Satan doesn't. And Jesus is saying, please don't do that. Come to me. I've died on the cross to give you salvation. So take my blood, be cleansed, and then be inside of my protection. And then all of that goes on to Satan in the last days. He will suffer for the sins he caused you to commit, but because you've accepted the grace and the blood of Jesus Christ, you're cleansed. You don't suffer for those things. Satan does. And so the devil is like, look, stay outside of God, and when we're outside of God, destruction comes. But it's Satan that is the one doing the destruction. It is Satan that wants to be the one who does the destruction, wants to be the destroyer. He is the one who wants to bring about these things. And God simply says, you know what? If you let sin have its natural course, it will kill. Salvation has its natural course. It brings salvation, eternal life. And so what were the consequences of transgressing God's law in the day of Noah? The flood came. The flood came. God said, I can't take care of you anymore, so here it comes, and I'm bringing in this. Same thing with Sodom and Gomorrah. He came down, and he said, you know what? This is it. I've entreated, I've asked, even uh, Abraham. You remember, how many people did Abraham say, if there's how many alive, you won't destroy? Ten. You know why he said ten, right? Oh, trivia. His family. He started with 170 and all the way down. He said, finally, if there's 10 in there, because he was thinking that Lot, his wife, the children, the daughters, the brother, he thought at least my family would be there and it would save them. But when God, when the angels got there, remember, who was it? It was just Lot, his wife, and two daughters. The Bible says they went to the other family to get them and they, what not? What do you, you know, again destroyed for lack of knowledge they have moved away from god's law and now they were caught up in this world and they were destroyed ultimately yes yes they they and, and remember the angels took them by the hand because they didn't want to leave they the angels took them by the hand and drug them out said get out get out leave and they did that because a uh, lot showed which was very, very important, the courtesy and hospitality to strangers. They Because there was a lot of people there, but only Lot brought them in. Lot didn't know who they were, but that was rewarded by his faithfulness in doing that. But even when he was leaving the city, you remember Lot says, we don't want to go up, please send us to another little city. Still in that heart. But his wife, it was too much. She looked back, phew, pillar of salt. But this tells us here that just like we see in every situation in the Bible, there comes a time when God says, that's it, it's over, then we have the consequences. Number eight, somebody read that for us. Do we have a volunteer to read uh, question number eight? Okay, yes, blue mic, Mo, thank you. Bravo. How does Hosea's prophecy apply to us today? God is applying restoring it to every penitent soul who united with his church on earth. Mm-hmm. Exactly. God wants to restore us. He wants us to come to him. He has grace for us. He loves us. And, and, and this is why uh, uh, Peter says... Um, that God is not willing that any should suffer, but that all should come to repentance. That's why probation continues to go on. But, you know, Spirit of Prophecy says there is a day, ultimately God knows this, because God is God. God has a day fixed at which when we reach that point, it's over and it will come. Now, we don't know that day because Jesus says, you know, we don't know the day or the hour, the problem with that, but God does. God does. Just like God knew there was a day when the flood was going to come, he knew there was a day with Sodom and Gomorrah, he knew there was a day when Jesus was going to come, the birth of Christ was predicted 
thousands of years before. He knew all of these things. God knows, and he has it. And God knows there's a day coming. And once that happens, you know, we looked at it in Revelation. We talked about that. The three angels' message goes out, and then that's it. The Sunday law comes. Death decree comes. The plagues, and Jesus is coming. The Father knows, and there will come a time when it will end. But we, we have to be careful because this chapter really brings on the whole idea of losing sight from day-to-day -day life, day-to-day -day responsibilities. We lose sight of God, His law, and His need of, to be in our homes. And that's what we have around us. People, if you go out and interview them today, they, the farthest thing from many people's mind is God and His law. They're so wrapped up in who's going to be president and they're missing the whole point. Do, do you really think that any president we put in there is going to fix the problems in this world? <laughs> right. Come on, brothers and sisters, let's be honest. I don't care who you vote for. You can put them in there. Now, can one do better than the other? And you people have great hope. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, you have great hope. Praise the Lord for that. Great hope, yes. But I'm telling you what, you know what, every president, and I've noticed something since I've been a kid. I think my first, was, was the first president I remember was Jimmy Carter? Does that date me? You gotta, do you know what they all say? Vote for me and I'll make it better. Vote for me and I'll make it better. Vote for me and I'll be better. Vote for me and I'll be better. Vote for me and I'll be better. Vote for me. They all say the same thing. And instead of going like this <laughs> Ooh, since I was a kid vote for me and I'll make it better the other ones did a bad job but I'll do better is that what they say all the time I, 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 I we have a, a little antenna so I was watching the news the campaign commercials are just oh, it's, it's overwhelming you watch the news and everyone and you know what they're doing they're bad, I'm good. No, you're bad, I'm good. No, you're bad, I'm good. You did this, I do will do that. You do this, and then... Yeah. God wants to restore us today. He wants to restore this nation. He wants to restore this church. He wants to restore your home, your family, your life. Number nine, it says, What will happen in the last days to God's commandment-keeping people? What's going to happen? Well, we know from Revelation, it tells us that, you know, the, the God has warned us that in the last days there's going to be trouble, but God's covenant with his commandment keeping people is to be renewed. Yes, yes. Go ahead, Angel. They will turn from every idol that binds them to earth and will worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Mm. They will free themselves from every entanglement and will stand before the world as monuments of God's mercy. Yes. Obedient to the divine requirements, they will be recognized by angels and by men as those that have kept the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. The separation. Uh, the commandment message is going out. The three angels' message is going out. You know, we, we spent the past three Sabbaths talking about that. You know, it's, sometimes it, it seems that it's uh, almost uh, undercover, but it is going out. And that's why I say pray for Doug Batchelor. Whatever you think about Doug Batchelor, we like him, we don't like him, whatever, but he's, he's trying. He's trying to present the message on Facebook. Uh, pray for, um, you know, John Bradshaw. Whatever you think of uh, Pastor John, I, I know John, I, I like him and I support It Is Written, you know. He's trying, he's putting out there, he's doing something. They're, they're trying to share the three angels' message, you're out there. And, um, uh, is it Pastor Carlton? I can't think, what is his last name, Pastor Carlton? Bird, Bird yes, from uh, Breath of Life. Uh, he, he just did the, the three angels' message too, you know, from uh, uh, Breath of Life from Oakwood University. Powerful, powerful. You know, these, these men of God, Pastor Bullion, who is, am I saying that right? Bullion? Man, there's a guy. Say what you want about him, but that brother is working night and day for the Hispanic community. And, and unfortunately, I don't know all the speakers for all around the world, but they're out there trying to do so. So pray for him, support him. The message is going on. We want to make sure that we do what we can to help and support that. 
He wants to renew us and separate us from the things of this world. Finally, number 10 here, it says, what does God promise his people of Israel? What does God promise his people Israel? And here is what we hold on to. Let me get to this right there, the very last paragraph. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the tender and the trender of grapes I'm sorry, my glasses. Trader of grapes, him that soweth seeds, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt, and I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit thereof, and I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled out of the land of their land which I have given them, saith the Lord God. The promise is to restore his people. And you know, this is really heaven language because what's going to happen in heaven? We get the city home and then we have a country home where Isaiah says, and we'll look at this, he says, you'll have vineyards, you'll plant in another one. You'll build a house and you'll live in it. Nobody will steal it, break into it. You know, Christ talks about the, the new wine that he will drink with us in heaven. You know, he says, I won't drink of this wine again until that day. You know, there's going to be this, this idea of God taking care of us and supplying us, and that's what he's holding on to us. Unfortunately, the northern tribe did not receive that. Destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that is a warning for us today to make sure that we don't fall into that same trap, that we forget the knowledge of God, we forget the knowledge of his law, and the result is that the destruction is coming. And it may be that we're, and I think it is, we're at this place now where we're so far gone in America this, this country is never going to have a revival and reformation. I don't believe that. I, I don't see it in Bible prophecy. I don't see it in spirit of prophecy. This country now is set on a course to destruction, just like the Titanic, and it's going to sink. Warnings are coming in, but it's not going to be heeded. We're headed for that. So we need to make sure that we are with God, protected by God, sharing the message, trying to help people prepare to save those who will listen. Save those that are listening, because a lot of people will hear and a lot of people respond. A lot of people want to know that there's something out there better. And so, whew, wow, what a warning for us, amen? What a warning for us. All right, section three, we're going to start into that next week. Olga, did you have a statement? Uh, yeah, Bring my I wanted to say that even though, like you were saying, to be ready, because it's going to go going to get just worse it's not going to get better but it's a hope for us that we know that jesus is coming amen and and it's also sad at the same time because there's sometimes family or friends that reject to right. get to to know the truth or even if not about religion about just accepting jesus god right. in your life and make a change for the good for your salvation yeah. and that I just, if we go with prayer, I want to pray for my, for my uncle because he's been in the uh, rehab for months since the month of April. But my sister wanted to finally got him into her nursing with the, she does dialysis. Mm -hmm. And she said, hey, you know, he was able to see now family, but even there, right. she, wants, she wanted to bring him a, a book, A Step to Christ in Spanish. And his answer was no. Mm. He went like this to her. Yeah. Like, in your, in, you've been in the hospital. We've been praying for him. Yeah. And his answer was no. Yeah. yeah. And that was, I, I carry that sadness. My sister, I do. Right. My mom, we all do. And we're going to keep on praying. I want to pray for him because... Yeah. Don't give up prayers no, I'm not. as long I'm as not. there's a breath and, you know, we trust that, uh, you, you know, the think. Lord is in the business of salvation. Yeah. He's in the business of salvation. He died for us to bring salvation. So we have to keep praying for yeah. them and, and interceding for them. And we definitely want to pray for yes. your uncle tonight. Yep. Yes. And uh, for those watching online, if you'd like to post a prayer request, uh, do we have anybody here local have other prayer requests? Uh, I want to remember uh, Kathy's family, the loss of her mother. So sad to hear about that. Um, Cynthia. Cynthia, Cynthia, I'm sorry. Cynthia, yes. Pray for Cynthia. Um, and then uh, 
remember Paul. Uh, we had the, the funeral this week for Robbie. Um, sad to see that happen. And, um, you know, we have the elections next week. It's uh, November 2nd, next Tuesday. You know, we're less than a week away. So those are coming up. And, you know, I just, I just pray that, that uh, the Lord works through this because, you know, everything is... Well, if he gets in, and I'm, I'm not accepting it, and, and riots are planned, and we're going to do this if that person gets in, and, and the, the system is so convoluted and, and, man, corrupt and broken. It's all this stuff. The media is just feeding all of this stuff, and, and, and you know, the media is not helping in any of these things. But understand that that's not accidental. So we've got to make sure that we're reading our Bible first and see everything happening through the lens of the Bible. Uh, some online prayer requests, yes. So Ella has a request that says, please pray for Rodney, whose uh, mother, Leon's uh, funeral, is tomorrow morning. So pray for them, the funeral is tomorrow morning. Mm. And then uh, on Facebook it says, prayer can break all chains. Amen, amen. All right, all right. So um, next week, section three, we begin a preacher of righteousness looking into the life of Isaiah. Isaiah, powerful prophet, powerful book, the second Bible. <laughs> 66 chapters in Isaiah, 66 books in the Bible, uh, the, the book of Isaiah, wonderful. So we're keeping in. So we have those prayer requests, and um, uh, thank you for those, and we'll continue to uh, lift each other up and... Um, Let's close now with a prayer here this evening. Father in heaven, we want to come before your presence. The chapter tonight, the title alone is so important, destroyed for lack of knowledge. Lord, we, we pray that your Holy Spirit will please help us. Please empower us. We have your word all around us. Let us not neglect what is right before us, especially here in this country. We have... The Bible's available on our phones and around. Lord, make sure, help us, pour out your spirit that we read and heed and listen and follow. I want to pray for Olga's uncle, Lord, is uh, the situation there that she shared. We just pray for them in a special way. Uh, pray for, man, we've had several requests here tonight of loved ones who have passed away. And Lord, we pray for each one of those families that you'll be with them and comfort them. Pray for those that are still with the COVID and the ones that are uh, the new cases. Pray for our schools and our teachers. Continually intercede for them. Pray for our church here in Old Westbury. Lord, pray. I pray that you pour out your spirit upon all of our members, those here watching online and all of those that are in this membership, as well as in this conference union division and around the world, Father. Your church is working, Lord. I pray that you'll be with them. Be with uh, Pastor Bachelor as he's doing the meetings. Uh, uh, be with Pastor John, who uh, recently had some question and answer things online as they continue to press forward online. Father, this weekend we have baptisms. Two young ladies that are just uh, so grateful for the way you've worked in their lives and are part of the church family. Pray for all of our members. Pray that you'll be with them. Bless them. Keep them safe. So we lay our lives into your hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.